मिडिल इंडिया पेज नंबर टू जीरो सिक्स थर्ड पैराग्राफ द ट्रेडिंग कम्युनिटी इन इंडिया डिड नॉट बिलोंग टू वन कास्ट और रिलीजन द गुजराती मर्चेंट्स इंक्लूडेड हिंदूज जैंस एंड मुस्लिम्स वर मोस्टली बोरास इन राजस्थान ओसवाल्स माहेश्वरीज एंड अग्रवाल्स बिगैन टू बी कॉल्ड द मारवाड़ीज Overland trade to Central Asia was in the hands of the Multanis, Afghans, and Khatris. The Marwaris spread out to Maharashtra and Bengal during the 18th century. The Chetis on the Coromandel coast and the Muslim merchants in the Malabar, both Indian and Arab, formed a more important, most important trading communities of South India. The trading community of India, especially in the port towns, included some of the richest merchants, who are comparable in wealth and power to the merchant princes in Europe. Thus, Vijay Vora dominated the Surat trade for several decades. He owned a large fleet of ships and was reputed to be amongst the wealthiest men of his time. Abdul Ghaffar Bora left fifty-five lakh rupees in cash and goods. Had a fleet of seventeen sea-going ships at the time of his death in seventeen eighteen. Similarly, Malay Chetty of the Coromandel coast, Kashi, Pirana, and the Sunka Rama Chetty were reputed to be extremely wealthy and had extensive commercial dealings in India and abroad. There was many wealthy merchants in Agra, Delhi, Balasore, Odisha. and bengal also some of these merchants especially those living in the coastal towns lived in an ostentatious manner and aped the manners of the nobles european travelers mention the commodious and well built houses of the wealthy merchants of agra and delhi lived but the ordinary sorts of li- ordinary sorts lived in houses above their shops The French traveler Bernier says that the merchants tried to look poor because they were afraid that they would be used to like filled sponges, that is, squeezed of their wealth. This does not appear to be fully correct. Emperors from the time of Shah Jahan passed many laws for protection, protecting the property of merchants. The laws of Shah Jahan are well known. Jahangir's ordinan- ordinances included a provision that if any one, whether unbeliever or Muslim, should die, his property and effort should be left for his heirs, here heirs, and no one should interfere with them. If he should have no heir, they should appoint inspectors and separate guardians to guard the property, so that its value might be expanded. expended in lawful expenditure such as building the mosque of building of mosque and sarais repair of broken bridges and the digging of tanks and wells however local officials could always abuse their powers to harass traders Despite some harassment, the property of the merchants were generally not in danger. Means of transport were cheap and adequate for their needs. Despite complaints by some European travelers, safety on the roads was satisfactory and could not be covered by insurance. The means of travel with sarais at the distance of five crores on the principal highways was as good as in Europe at the time. Nevertheless, trade and the traders continued to have a low social status. The influence of the merchants on political processes is a matter of controversy. Merchants in India were not without influence in political quarters where their own interests were concerned. Thus, each community of merchants had its leader or Nagar said, "Who could intercede with the local officials on their behalf?" We do have instances of strikes, hartal by merchants in Ahmedabad, and elsewhere to stress their points of view. We also have noted the involvement of members of the Mughal royal family and prominent nobles such as 
made Joomla in trade. Thus, the Mughal ruling class was not unconcerned with business and protection of the commercial interests of the country and the trading classes, though it is not as actively involved in pushing its business interests as some European states such as Britain, France and Holland were. Trade and commerce expanded in India during the 17th century due to a number of factors. An important factor was the political integration of the country under Mughal rule and establishment of conditions of law and order over extensive areas. The Mughals paid attention to roads and sarais which made communication easier. A uniform tax was levied on goods at the point of their entry into the empire. Road says or Radari was declared illegal though it continued to be collected by some of the local Rajas. The Mughal minted silver rupees of high purity which became a standard coin in India and abroad and thus helped India's trade. Some of the Mughal policies also helped the commercialization of the economy or the growth of a money economy. Salaries to the standing army as well as many of the administrative personnel but not to the nobles were paid in cash. Under the Zapti system, the land revenue was assessed and required to be paid in cash. Even when the peasant was given the option of choosing other methods of assessment such as crop sharing, the share of the state was generally sold in the villages and with the help of grain dealers. It has been eliminated, estimated that about 20% of the rural produce was marketed, which was a high proportion. The growth of the rural grain markets led to the rise of small townships or kasbas. The demand for all types of luxury goods by the nobles led to the expansion of handicraft production and to the growth of towns. Already during the 16th century, a number of major towns had developed in the country. According to Ralph Fitch, Agra, Fatehpur Sikri were larger than London and one of the biggest towns in Europe, Montserrat, the Jesuit priest who came to Akbar's court, says that Lahore was second to none of the cities in Europe or Asia. A recent study shows that Agra more than doubled in size during the 17th century. Bernier, who wrote, the middle, who wrote in the middle of 17th century, says that Delhi was not less than Paris and that Agra was bigger than Delhi. During the period, Ahmednagar and Buranpur in the west, Multan in the northwest, and Patna, Rajmahal, and Dekka in the east grew to become big towns. Thus, Ahmedabad was as large as London and its suburbs, and Patna had a population of 2 lakhs, a large size by the standard of those times. All those towns were not only administrative centers but developed as centers of trade and manufacture. The Mughal ability to collect a high share of the rural produce which was commuted into the money and its concentration in the hands of the nobility, nobility stimulated the demand of all kinds of luxury goods including building materials for residential houses, sarais, bowlies, etc. The growth of arms and manufacturers, guns of all types, cannons, armor, etc and of shipping, shipping are two primary examples of result of direct government intervention in the matter. Both Akbar and Aurangzeb were deeply interested in the manufacture of guns of all types including mobile guns and took steps to improve their production. Indian steel swords were also in demand outside India. In 1651, Shah Jahan initiated a program of building sea-going vessels and four to six ships were built for voyages in West Asia. 
In the following year, six ships were put into commission. This was part of a shipbuilding program of many wealthy merchants and nobles. In consequence, Indian shipyards were soon in a position to produce ships based on European models. Medieval India, page number 204, the middle strata. There has been a lot of discussion whether during the medieval period India had a middle class or not. The Frenchman Bernier said that in India there was no middle state. A person was either extremely rich or lived miserably. It is however not possible to agree with the statement. The word middle class means traders and shopkeepers. India had a large class of rich traders and merchants, some of them being amongst the richest merchants of the world at that time. These merchants also had their own rights based on tradition and protection of life and property. But they did not have the right to administer any of the towns. Such rights had been acquired in the Europe by the merchants in special circumstances. Also these rights tended to be abridged whenever strong territorial states grow up as in France and Britain. If by middle state is meant a section whose standard of living was between the rich and the poor, such sections were large in Mughal India. They include the small mansabdars, petty shopkeepers and a small but important section of master craftsmen. It also included a class of professional hakims, leading musicians and artists, historians, scholars, qazis, theologians, and a large class of petty official or pen publishers who ran the large and growing Mughal administrative apparatus. While the petty officials were generally paid in cash and supplemented their income by means of corruption, many of the others, especially the scholars, religious divines, etc., were granted small tracts of land for maintenance. Such grants were called Made Mash, Madad e Mash in Mughal terminology of Sashin in Rajasthan. In addition to the Mughal emperor, local rulers and zamindars and even nobles made such grants. Although these grants were to be renewed by every ruler, they often became hereditary in practice. These sections often became part of the rural gentry and link between the village and the town. Writers, historians and theologians often belong to the same class. The middle strata did not form a class, the interests of different sections being different. They were also drawn from various religious groups on castes. Organization of Trade and Commerce The Indian trading classes were large in numbers, spread out all over the country, well organized and highly professional. Some specialized in long distance, inter-regional trade and some in local retail trade. The former were called Sait, Bora or Modi, while the latter were called Beoparis or Banik. In addition to retailing goods, the Baniks had their own agents in the villages and townships with whose help they purchased food grains and cash crops. There were a special class of traders, the Banjaras, who specialized in carrying bulk goods. The Banjaras used to move long distances, sometimes with thousands of oxen carrying food grains, pulses, ghee, salt, etc. The more expensive goods such as textiles, silks, etc. were laden on camels and mules or in carts, but it was cheaper to move bulk goods through the rivers on boats. Boat traffic on waterways and coastal trade along the seashore was more highly developed than now. The trade in foodstuffs and wide range of textile products were more important components of inter-regional trade during the period. 
Bengal exported sugar and rice as well as delicate muslin and silk. The coast of Coromandel had become a center for textile production and had a brisk brisk trade with Gujarat both along the coast and across the Deccan. Gujarat was the entry point of foreign goods. It exported the fine textiles and silks Patal Patola to north to north India with Burhanpur and Agra as the two nodal points of trade. It received food grains and silk from Bengal and also imported pepper from Malabar. North India imported luxury items and also exported indigo and food grains. Lahore was another center of handicraft production. It was also the distribution center for the luxury products of Kashmir, shawls, carpets, etc. The products of Punjab and Sindh moved down the river Indus. It had close trade links with Kabul and Kandahar on one hand and with Delhi and Agra on the other. It will thus be seen that India's inter-regional trade was not in luxuries alone. The movement of the goods was made possible by a complex network linking wholesalers with merchants down to regional and local levels through agents, gumashtas and commission agents, the lals. The Dutch and the English traders who came to Gujarat in the 17th century found that the Indian traders to be active and alert. There was a keen competition for inside information and whenever there was a demand for goods in one part of the country, it was rapidly made good. The movement of goods was also facilitated by the growth of financial system which permitted easy transmission of money from one part of the country to another. This was done through the use of hundis. The hundi was a letter of credit payable after a period of time at a discount. The hundis often included insurance which was charged at a different would charge at a different rates on the basis of value of goods, destination, means of transport, land, river or sea, etc. The sarafs or the sheriffs who specialized in changing money also specialized in dealing with hundis. In the process, they also acted as private banks. They kept money in deposit from the nobles and lent it. By means of hundis, they created credit which supplemented the money in circulation. Hence, the merchant could cash his hundi after he had sold his goods at the point of his destination. Movement of money which was always risky enterprise could be reduced, especially when the rich traders such as Virji Vora set up agency houses in different parts of India and also in West Asia.